The shoulder is an amazing joint. It does explosive activities. We can weight bear through our shoulders. We can take our whole body weight through our shoulders. We use our shoulders to position our hands to perform high precision activities. The shoulder's got more mobility than any other joint in the body. It goes through more range of movement. It can tuck our shirts in. It can pitch baseballs. It can throw cricket balls. It can serve in tennis. It's got more mo movement than any other joint in the body, and it's also got the fastest movement of any joint in the body. So if you look at some sports such as baseball, people can move through an arc of 80 degrees and up to 9,000 degrees a second, so they're moving with incredible speed. They're de-accelerating their shoulders at around about half a million degrees a second squared, and this is all occurring in a joint that doesn't have much bony stability. So. What's really exciting from my perspective about the shoulder is a lot of the stability and a lot of the movement is totally dependent upon muscle function. So a lot of people will be given a diagnosis of bursitis or rotator cuff tendonitis or rotator cuff tendinopathy, which sort of implicates the tendon and related structures, but we don't really know where a patient's symptoms are coming from and it's, it's hypothesized that it might be coming from the tendon tissue, the bursal tissue. And so there's been an assumption for a long time that if you see a change on imaging it explains symptoms, but it clearly doesn't. So we know that up to 96% of people who have no symptoms at all, who have an ultrasound scan, might have findings such as bursal thickening, tendinopathy, partial thickness tears, full thickness tears, labral damage. The implication of that's quite serious because what it means is that people who have positive clinical tests and positive imaging findings such as a tear might be recommended that surgery is a good option for them and in many cases it might be. But the problem is if you're making clinical decisions based on, on imaging that can't really tell us where the symptoms are coming from then a lot of people, maybe 50% of people, will be having operations on tissues that are not causing those, their symptoms. So there's been a whole battery of shoulder special tests that have been um, recommended for clinicians to perform. These tests have been designed primarily on anatomical basis, that in a particular position you might be contracting or compressing a particular tissue, you might be stretching a particular tissue. The problem with the special tests are uh, that all the tissues around the shoulder are innovated, they all have a nerve supply, and that we're testing multiple structures per test. And the moment you're testing more than one structure, it's very difficult to know what actual structure you are, you are implicating. And the other problem is the, the idea of the special tests are that they are designed to either rule in a particular structure or rule out a particular structure. So the way that evidence-based practice is formulated is that when you've got a clinical test that's positive, you need to compare it to a diagnostic test. So if someone had diabetes, you'd be comparing the clinical signs such as fatigue and tiredness, increased frequency of, of going to the bathroom, against a, a gold standard test, a blood test, that would help a clinician rule in or rule out the possibility that the patient had diabetes. The gold standard tests in orthopaedics are going to be MRI, ultrasound, x-ray, or observation of structural failure during an arthroscopic procedure. The assumption here is that the observation of tissue damage is where the symptoms are coming from. So we compare a test for supraspinatus clinical test against a finding of an ultrasound that the supraspinatus is, is damaged or torn partially or completely. But as I mentioned earlier, there's been now a wealth of studies published that show there's a very poor correlation between imaging findings and where symptoms are coming from. So we don't actually have a gold standard reference test to compare the, the clinical tests against. And so, in all honesty, the special tests are not special at all. So the special tests, we could say, are simply tests that might provoke symptoms, but you'd be a very brave person to actually say you know where those symptoms are coming from. We really need to be using careful language with our patients. We need to be telling patients, or the surgeons need to be telling patients that the tears may be causing symptoms, but they may not be causing symptoms. That if we look carefully at the research evidence, there's an equal chance of getting better with an exercise-based program for people who are diagnosed with impingement, 
for people who are diagnosed with partial thickness tears that are atraumatic and full thickness tears that are atraumatic as they would with surgery. So we need to be telling patients that they need not to worry about the tear in many cases, that it's something that happens but doesn't necessarily cause symptoms, that exercise-based approaches are just as, as effective as surgical-based approaches for many conditions, and that if a conservative-based treatment, an exercise-based treatment, a non-surgical treatment approach isn't helpful, then of course then surgery is a very appropriate procedure to consider, but not to rush to it just because of what the imaging identified in people without trauma.